So the gospel tells us something completely different. The gospel tells us that God accepts us, and then out of love we obey. The gospel tells us that we obey God to get God, because our joy is found in Him, not anything that we can get from Him. And the gospel tells us that our self-worth and identity is found in the grace of Jesus Christ, who was beaten, He was spit on, He was mocked, He was crucified on a cross. And he was separated from God in our place for our sins. Our identity is found in humility. Our identity is found in God who had to die for us. This leaves us unable, no ability to look down and be judgmental of, every, of anyone else. It's only by grace. Not anything we've done or anything we are, but it's only by grace that we're saved. So the gospel shows us how infinite we are and how omnipotent. We're almighty, all-powerful God is. But religion tries to reverse the equation. Religion tries to make man powerful, and God becomes the vending machine. I obey God to get things from God. It's like putting a coin in the vending machine. There's no real security in God in religion. Religion looks for security in my actions, what I do, who I am. So instead of trusting in God, King Ahaz, he trusts in Assyria. We learn in 2 Chronicles 28, you don't have to turn it, that Isaiah sends, or that Ahaz, excuse me, sends a message to Assyria during this attack from this uh, Israel-Syria alliance. He's sending a plea for help from Assyria, this great nation. He would rather trust in the great nation instead of the one who, through his sovereignty, allowed the nation to become great. He's finding false security in something other than God. So after Ahaz rejects God's offer for a sign, in verse 13 to 14, Isaiah now turns to the entire, to the entire house of David. And he says in verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself can give you a son. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. This is the familiar virgin birth prophecy that um, Mike read in Matthew. Um, and on the surface, it seems a little bit odd. You see, it was fulfilled several years in the future as a sign for the house of David, King Ahaz. But ultimately it was fulfilled 700 years in the future at the birth of Jesus Christ. It's called a double fulfillment. Immediate fulfillment, latter fulfillment. But we need to understand the purpose of this sign for Ahaz and for the house of David and for us. It's not to create faith. Signs are not a supernatural act that made unbelievers believe. Rather, they confirm faith. Faith is always faith. There's at some point where we can no longer reason. A great example of this is in the movie Signs. Signs is about a man named Grant Hess. He's a farmer who discovers the crops are plowed in his field. And the crops are going to be signs from extraterrestrial beings that are coming to a death. But the, the film's not really about crop circles or the aliens. You see, Graham was an Episcopalian priest who, after his wife died in a horrific accident, he walks away from the faith. His brother is a failed uh, minor league baseball player who never made it to the major leagues. His son suffers from severe respiratory issues related to asthma. And his daughter has the habit of leaving these uh, half full of water glasses around the house, despite her father's constant uh, commands for her to put them away in the same. But throughout the movie, you get these glimpses into Graham's life. And that since he's walked away from the faith, that his life has not been stable. His children, his brother, they don't respect him. And the town still loves him for spiritual advice, despite him being spiritually dead. At the end of the movie, Graham locks his family in the house when he figures out the aliens are coming to attack, with no hope that his family will survive them. And at one point in the, in the they're locked in the house. His son has an asthma attack, and they don't have the inhaler with them. And an alien actually makes it into the house and sprays Graham's son with a poisonous gas straight in the face. And it's at this point Graham finds faith in God. <clears throat> he realizes that there's been signs throughout his life that God has not given up on. That his son had asthma, so the gas wouldn't enter his lungs. That his brother never made it to the major league so he could be there to defend his family 
with this home run bat that was hung over the fireplace. And then his daughter left all these glasses of water around the house because that was the alien's weakness and they could use it to beat the creature. The point is this. In Graham's life while faithless, the signs made no sense. They were a hindrance. They were a folly to him. In fact, he hated God for them. He hated God for his brother not making it to the major leagues. He hated God for his wife died, for his son who suffered from asthma. Until he found faith. Because to the faithful, signs help us stand firm. And this is just like the problem of the leaders during Jesus' time. Remember, they asked Jesus for signs so they could have faith. They wanted signs to create faith, but there was no faith in the And it's because they had a false view of the signs that were given to the Israelites during their exodus from Egypt to the Promised Land. Remember, God fed Israelites with the manna. They thought those signs were to create faith. Now think about this. Did those signs ever create faith? The entire generation that was fed in the wilderness died in the wilderness because of their lack of faith. So just as God gave Ahaz a sign, the entire house of David a sign, he's giving us a sign not to give us faith. The fulfillment of the virgin birth of Christ, Isaiah is giving us a sign, God is giving us a sign to stand firm in our faith. So practically speaking, what does standing firm in our faith look like? We all have this basic need in our lives for the feeling of security. And we find security in the most tangible things. We find security, false security, in money, social status, <coughs> successful careers, love, relationships, uh, material possessions, appearances, whatever. First, we identify these false securities. We identify these idols because it is idolatry. And then we turn from these false securities and we find security in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It could, it could be making the right decision in the office even if it means it will cost you time, <coughs> reputation, or money. Not because you have to make the right decision, that's religion, but because you want to make the right decision. Because our faith is in Christ, not our reputation. It could simply be following conviction to be more generous or charitable with your funds. Not because you have to or because it will boost your reputation, that's religion, but because you want to be more generous. Because when you look to Christ and the virgin birth, his incarnation, and his sacrifice at the cross, and the generosity shown there, you want to image him. You want to image God. This means we don't have to brag about where we live, what kind of jobs we have, or what social circles we're a part of. Because ultimately our identity isn't wrapped up in that, but our identity is in Christ. We're free from the pressure of maintaining wealth or status. Because positionally in Christ, we are redeemed and loved by God, and nothing can separate us from that. There's nothing we have to maintain, unlike what religion tells us. We just believe in His finished work. Standing firm in our faith is resting on the work of Jesus Christ, no matter how bad or how good our situation in life becomes. And when we turn from these false securities and stand firm in faith in Jesus Christ, there's nothing more free than that. Think about it. Then we can truly use our time, our relationships, or our career to serve and glorify God. Abraham wanted his whole life to have a son. So finally, when Abraham was over the age of 100, his wife Sarah gave birth to a baby boy. It wasn't too long after that, God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, his deepest desire. Why? Because our deepest desires should be for God. God asked Ahaz to rely on him, that he would protect Jerusalem. Ahaz's deepest desire was worldly power. God is asking us to stand firm in our faith. And I'll end by asking this. What is our deepest desire? As history unfolded, we learn that King Ahaz did not stand firm in faith. Every aspect of his life and reign of Judah was unstable. Career, money, or relationships can never give us what only God can deliver. Peace, security, 